Well, it's time for another jaunty climb up Baden Hill. And what's interesting is Baden Hill is located in the place that we're going to study during this unit, at least one of the places. Baden Hill, usually spelled B-A-D-O-N, uh, was the location of one of King Arthur's most famous battles. And so during this segment of our unit, we will be discussing King Arthur's homeland. Now, we will call this unit Bridges. And that right away makes us think of some of the most famous bridges that we've seen in photographs or maybe in person. And maybe you think of Golden Gate Bridge, or maybe you think of London Bridge, falling down, falling down, falling down. Well, London Bridge has fallen down and has been rebuilt over uh, the centuries that it's been standing. And I think that's a reminder that over time, things change. But we can say that the more things change, the more they stay the same. When we study human beings, we're also coming to understand how patterns form and how even though some people may rise or fall or move to different locations, they're still people. And I hope that that brings us together. And uh, this unit is going to be discussing a very diverse continent, even though it's technically not a separate continent. It's part of a bigger landmass called Eurasia, but we usually think of Europe as one of the, the seven continents. And I, I want you to see that even though there's diversity in Europe, that they've been able to come together in a kind of union. Recently, that union has been threatened a little bit by the British exit, the Brexit. And that will change the way that those countries interact with one another. But we need to understand a little bit of Europe's history and even more importantly, Europe's geography in order to understand the patterns of human beings in that place, in that location. And in order to understand things, we're going to need a little help. And to be specific, we're going to need Mr. Help. Mr. Help. M-R-H-E-L-P is an acronym, and Mr. HELP stands for the themes of geography, and it's actually five themes of geography, but we have six letters, so we could call it the six themes of geography in this case, and two of them go together. So the first one is movement. M stands for movement. Movement means how people go from one place to another over time sometimes very rapidly, and we call this migration, uh, immigration, emigration. Uh, even we in the Bible, we refer to it as an exodus. So movement is very critical if we're going to try to understand geography. Now remember, geography comes from the word geo, which goes back to Greek mythology. Mother Earth was Gaia or Gia, and uh, graph means to write down. So geography means to write down about the earth. And that is what the, the study of geography is. It's a bunch of writing or knowledge about the earth and how it's changed and how it's how one place is different from another place. So the M in Mr. Help stands for movement. R stands for region or regions. And this helps us understand patterns. We're not just thinking of individual cities. We're looking at patterns over a certain area of land or ocean or just space on the Earth's surface. And uh, we try to group things together. So we have regions and we want to see how one region might be different from another region that's close to it and, and come to understand why. Sometimes regions are different because of landforms, sometimes because of climate patterns. And those are very uh, closely connected. So R stands for region. H and E go together. That's because H stands for human and E stands for environment. And you always have humans existing in an environment. Now, on one hand, we know that the environment impacts human beings very much. People who live in a desert will have a totally different lifestyle from people who live in mountains or by the sea. 
And so the environment affects human beings. But human beings over time have learned more and more uh, different ways to impact the environment for better, if you think of it in terms of efficiency and production, but also for worse, if you think of it in terms of pollution and things like, you know, climate change that we're experiencing now that we many people believe comes from human uh, activity. So H and E go together, and then you have L. And L and P actually go together, but they're, they're kind of two sides of the same coin. On one hand, you have L, which stands for location. That is a specific place on the Earth's surface. And it could be on another planet, too. I mean, we could be talking about location on Mars before too long. But location is really the definition of that, that you know, that area. <laughs> I'm trying not to say the word place because that's a whole different thing. Location is specific coordinates using latitude and longitude. It's, uh, you, can, you can look at relative location, a location compared to another location. Is it close by? Uh, you know, what direction do you need to go to get to that location? It's kind of like GPS, right? And you can also have absolute location, which is those longitude and latitude. So no matter where you are, you always have an absolute location that you can pinpoint. Uh, so it's not just, you know, go west from Rhodesia or whatever it might be. So uh, location is one side of the coin and place is the other side. It is the description. It is explaining characteristics of that location, of that uh, city, of that uh, area. And when you describe it, you're giving climate patterns and maybe even historical patterns, something that has shaped the nature of that place. So location is pretty much a definition and place is a description. And I hope you understand a little bit better now the themes of geography as we're introduced to Mr. Help and hopefully he'll be able to give us a hand as we learn about Europe. We're going to talk specifically about the European continent. So there's going to be a lot of information very quickly here. Hopefully you'll be able to uh, take notes as you watch this video. Otherwise, rewatch it. You know, slow it down, whatever you need to do. Let's talk about the features of Europe. And we'll start with the fact that Europe is often considered the land of peninsulas. It has many, many peninsulas, which are points of land, portions of land that jut or stick out into a body of water. And so the whole coastline of, of Europe, because it's been eroded over the centuries, it's been changed, it's been shaped, it's got a really unique, uh, a, a unique look to it. And so I, I'm going to start just going around the the continent and showing you the different peninsulas. So if we talk about the very western part of Europe, we have France sticking out into the Atlantic Ocean, and that is called uh, Brittany. Brittany is the name of the peninsula that is France, at least the part that sticks out into the ocean. So the Brittany Peninsula, we could say. Now, since we're talking about France and how it sticks out into the Atlantic Ocean, we also need to understand that most of Europe, especially kind of the northern half of Europe, all the way across into Russia, because part of Russia is considered to be in the European continent, on the European continent, and the rest of Russia is in the Asian continent, if you divide it that way. Uh, that is called the, the European Plain, and sometimes we refer to the North European Plain or the East European Plain. The most important thing you need to know is that is an area that is generally good for agriculture. Uh, it's fairly temperate land. You know, there are seasonal uh, rains that come, uh, colder winters. So, you know, it's northern areas. It's very much like the Great Plains of the United States or Canada. So that is a, a very important part of geography that you need to know regarding Europe. You have the Brittany Peninsula of France, and then you have the European plain that just goes 
all the way across Northern Europe and into Russia then, Eastern Europe and Russia. Another peninsula that you need to know uh, if you continue going east is Jutland. And Jutland, I'm guessing that that uh, Jutland has led to the English word jut, which means to stick out. So probably, you know, the Jutes were uh, one of the uh, Scandinavian tribes that settled in England and they brought their vocabulary with them. So I'm guessing, although I haven't researched it, that that word that we have to jut comes from Jutland, which is Denmark. And so the Jutland Peninsula is the next one. Scandinavia is a, a peninsula that's above Jutland, right? And, and usually Scandinavia would include Denmark as well and even Iceland. Uh, but the main thing you need to know is that that Scandinavian peninsula is, is very important. It includes Norway, Sweden, and Finland. Then uh, I'm gonna back up and kind of go down the south, okay? Uh, so south of Brittany, you have another peninsula that is the Iberian Peninsula, and that's where Portugal and Spain are. And then if you continue over, uh, you have the boot, you have the Italian peninsula, and uh, finally, you have the, the Balkan Peninsula. So you have the boot, and then you have another peninsula right next to it, and those are the foundations of Western civilization, Italy or Rome and Greece. And the fact that, that, that they had uh, all that access to the Mediterranean Sea was very important for the development of their civilization. They had lots of rocky land, not always great for agriculture, but they developed as a sea people, and then they, they spread out very quickly to colonize other areas, to get more fire, farmland, to produce more food, to have more people and, and grow their empire. Uh, so the Balkan Peninsula is where Greece is in the south, but there are also many other nations. We refer to a, an area that has been broken apart over history because of different groups of people. We refer to that as being Balkanized because of the way the Balkan Peninsula is with so many different people, groups, and languages. Next, we're going to talk about uh, mountains and the mountains mountain ranges you need to know in Europe include the Alps, which is kind of like the Himalayas of Europe, okay, in the center. It's the center and uh, some very high mountains there. Maybe the most famous is the Matterhorn. Uh, and it's famous again for its, its scenery, but also they produce the cheese and, and watches of the world, right? So that's that's Switzerland, but the Alps are also in Austria and Italy, northern Italy. The Apennines form the the rest of Italy. So you have the Alps that are kind of knotted at the top of Italy, and then you also have the Apennines, which run along the spine of Italy. Uh, the Carpathians are in Eastern Europe, in Hungary specifically, and. and, and I should say Hungary and Romania and it's it's Eastern Europe. So those are the Carpathians. Romania, I think, actually may not be in Hungary. I'll have to check my map. Uh, but the next mountain chain you should know about are the Pyrenees. Pyrenees are very significant historically because they divide France from Spain. And so you have those two peninsulas jutting out into the Atlantic and then you have this Pyrenees mountain range, which separates the Iberian Peninsula. It, it led to Spain considering itself to be a nation and France as well. Then you also have the Caucasus Mountains. The Caucasus Mountains are on the very, very east of uh, Europe, and they are in countries like Georgia, which these are former Soviet republics when the Soviet Union was uh, a very big empire or uh, country. And so Georgia, Armenia, uh, Azerbaijan, those are areas that have the Caucasus Mountains. And so when we refer to those countries, we'll often say the Caucasus countries, Caucasus states. Rivers in Europe include the Danube which is most famous as being uh, 
uh, in Hungary, but also goes through Vienna. The Danube is is kind of a wild uh, river in in Western European literature. It's seen as being exotic, uh, mysterious, even haunted. So the Danube. Sometimes you'll hear the Blue Danube uh, referencing the the color of the water, of course. Uh, the Rhine River is in uh, in Germany today. Remember, Germany hasn't always been a country like it is today, but it goes through uh, Cologne, and uh, it's a again a long major river in Europe. The Rhone River uh, is in Switzerland mainly, and the the Seine, the Seine. It looks like Seine or Seine, but it's the Seine. Le, Le Seine, I'll speak my French here, is the river that goes through Paris. And the Tiber is the river that goes through Rome. So obviously you have major cities that have grown up along these major rivers in Europe. Seas are very important to the development of Europe. And you have seas that separate the various peninsulas. So you have the, the Adriatic Sea, which separates uh, Italy from Greece. And you also have the Aegean Sea, which separates Greece from Turkey. Okay, Turkey, where the Trojan War was fought, the, the Aegean Sea separates Greece and Turkey. And uh, up in the north, you have the, the Baltic Sea, there are actually two seas to the north of what we consider to be Europe most of the time. So you have the Baltic Sea and you also have the North Sea. We'll get to that in a second. So Baltic Sea, you then have the Black Sea, which is just uh, northeast of Turkey. And uh, this is kind of where Asia and Europe meet. And the, the Black Sea is kind of a horizontal sea. If you look at it, it looks like a horizontal blob. And then there's another one that looks like it's the Black Sea turned uh, vertically, and that's the Caspian Sea. And that is as far east as Europe goes. The Mediterranean Sea, of course, is in the middle. That's what it means, Middle Earth, Mediterranean. And again, the North Sea is up by uh, Scandinavia, and the North Sea is loaded with petroleum underneath the North Sea. It's one of the, the richest ocean areas where there is oil and natural gas. Let's talk a little bit about population and resources. Europe is an extremely populated uh, continent and uh, has more population than the United States. And uh, it is very densely populated because it's much smaller than the United States. And uh, Europe has seen shifts in its population going from being very rural to being uh, city dwellers. And this is important. If you look back in history, you know that for a long time there were tribes in Europe and eventually there was feudalism where you had a manor where there was a large property and it was owned by a lord or a lady, lord and lady, and then it was worked by serfs and peasants and so there was a whole system, kind of a plantation system. And those serfs didn't have a lot of money, but they were protected by the Lord. And so uh, over time, that really influenced the development of Europe. Uh, towns did grow up close to the manors, and eventually serfs were able to move to those towns and learn trades, and, and people moved from being agricultural workers to being city dwellers. and, and um, you know, our word uh, Berg means city, and that's that goes back to German. And so if you talk about the uh, the middle class, we say the bourgeoisie. Bourgeoisie is coming from that same root of city dwellers. The city dwellers ended up being a middle class of people. Well, eventually in 1750 or around there, uh, the Industrial Revolution got going first in England and, or Scotland and England and, and then spreading throughout Europe. And that led to major shifts 
uh, in the way that people lived. Of, of course, they moved to the cities, but then they also started using machines. And from that time forward, we have humans interacting with the environment in negative ways, polluting. And that has just accelerated through the 19th century and 20th century. And now in the 21st century, we realize that it's affecting our climate. And so uh, one thing that has happened specifically in Europe is acid rain. This happens when you have uh, sulfur oxide being produced. Uh, that's how it was before with factories and they've reduced that. Over time, they've passed laws to reduce factory output. Unfortunately, they have nitrogen oxides that are created from car emissions. And so nitrogen oxides, uh, they do a couple of things. First, they, they do create uh, acid in the air and then that you know rains down and goes into the water and it's killed fish but it's also work that the nitrogen has worked like a fertilizer which sounds good right don't you want fertilizer to grow things but the problem is it's getting it getting into the ocean and it's creating algae growth and that algae growth has again thrown off the balance of the ecosystem and so Europe, especially countries like Norway and Sweden, ironically, they haven't produced all this acid rain, but they get it from, from the rest of uh, Europe. And so they're kind of fighting to reduce emissions and, you know, go to electric energy, uh, not, not uh, fossil fuels, but having electric cars and things like that to reduce emissions. So that's a major issue. Uh, you know that there are many languages in Europe, and one of the things that is important to know is that uh, a lot of these languages do come from Latin. You have the Romance languages of Italian and French and Romanian and Spanish. Romanian is the closest language we have today to the old Latin. And Latin is a dead language. It's not spoken today, but it's still an important part of all these other languages. You also have Germanic languages. So English is a language that comes from those German tribes that ultimately settled in England. And um, major religions, this is an important thing to note. Uh, you know, Europe was the center of Catholicism, and then it was also the center of Protestantism. Uh, so in the center of Europe, you have a lot of Lutherans and you have uh, Calvinists in the north and especially like in Scotland, that's where you have people who believed uh, in the teachings of John Calvin. Uh, so similar to Lutherans, but that, that, that's another kind of Protestant. And you have the Anglican Church in England that was its own Protestant church. But what's really interesting is a country like the Netherlands, uh, it actually is almost not any religion. It's an atheist country. 70% of the people in the Netherlands do not believe in any religion. And so that is a sign of what's happening in Europe, generally speaking. On the other hand, you have many immigrants that are coming in from the East and they are changing things because many of them are Muslim. You also have Hindus that have come from India. Uh, and this is definitely changing things and Chinese who have their own religions as well. And so religion is something that is changing in the European continent. You also have uh, just a reminder that things in Europe were shaped dramatically by the Romans in the Roman Empire. Uh, the sites that cities are located at are based on original Roman forts and Roman sites. And you also have uh, roads and highways that still follow the highways created by the Romans. During the Roman Empire's golden age, we call it the Pax Romana, that was the Roman peace that lasted roughly from 20 BC to 180 AD. That was a 200 year period of peace. Uh, sometimes we talks about the, the we, we talk about the Pax Europea. That's the peace of Europe, which has happened since World War II as Europe hasn't been fighting wars with each other. Uh, there was also kind of a, a European peace during uh, the 1800s after the Congress of Vienna in, in 1815. So um, these are all important things to talk about when we try to understand Europe and to see how industrialized it's become and how urbanized it's become, even though it has a very rural and agricultural past.
We're going to turn now to specific countries or countries within countries. And I will not dwell on a lot of these features, but I, it's important that you know the basics of every country that we're going to study. And we're going to start with the country that maybe is closest to us as Americans in Europe, and that would be England. England, as you know, is a part of what can be called uh, the United Kingdom. Now, the United Kingdom goes back to 1700 when England and Scotland got together. And at that time, England actually included Wales. So you could say England and Scotland and Wales were united all the way back to 1700. Notice Ireland was not a part of that equation. So the United Kingdom is one, that's what we usually refer to when we talk about this country or this country of countries. And the UK had an empire over the whole world. We also call this Great Britain. Great Britain uh, really should be referring only to the main island, the biggest, the bigger or biggest of the island in that cluster of islands. And so Great Britain would include, again, uh, Scotland and England and Wales. It wouldn't include Ireland, which is across the Irish Sea. And so um, another name that we have is uh, the United Kingdom of uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. <laughs> okay, so that is saying that there's a United Kingdom of the main island and also Northern Ireland. Ireland is a whole separate entity, but to include all of those islands in that group, and a group of islands is called an archipelago, which comes from the ancient Greek, which means ark, which is chief, and pelago, which means sea. The chief sea refers to the Aegean Sea because the Aegean Sea had all those little islands in it. Now, in our language, it's referring to the islands, not the sea. So any group of islands is called an archipelago. And the British Isles are known as an archipelago, and that would include Ireland. So that's all the different names that we can use. And we got to be careful because those have political connotations. There's political weight behind every name. And you want to be careful that you don't offend people by referring to them by the wrong name. I remember when I met some Irish co-workers when I was working in college and I, I tried to talk about their home, Ireland, as being a part of Great Britain and the British Isles. And they didn't like that very much. They wanted to be Irish. So England is known for its capital city, for sure. Uh, London is the capital of England, and it is the financial center of the world still today. It was the financial center for the, the British Empire, and, and so that's continued, and, and it's a, an amazing place of culture. And, and uh, today, it's a place of diversity. You have many people who have gone there from across Britain's empire, and now they are a part of London's tapestry. The river that flows through London is the Thames River. Don't say Thames, it's the Thames River. And uh, London Bridge is built across the Thames River. You need to know that L London is located in the southeast of the country and just across the waterway that is off the coast is the country of France. So between England and France is the English Channel. I bet the French don't like calling it that. And so even though it's known as the English Channel, it's what separates France and England. And uh, what you need to know too is that there is major oil uh, production and natural gas production that comes uh, from the east coast of Scotland uh, in the North Sea. Again, the North Sea is just this rich bed of petroleum products. Estimates say now that about 50% of the oil has been extracted, but it's still an enormous amount of oil that uh, provides a lot of money for the people of those areas. Uh, again, England is known for its financial services. About 80% of the people who work in England work in some sort of service industry, specifically financial services. It's the land of banks.
Let's talk about Scotland. Scotland is to the north of England and to the north of England and Wales. And uh, the two main cities are Glasgow and Edinburgh. Glasgow and Edinburgh. And those two cities, you know, they, they are fairly close to each other and they are, are basically the, the twin centers of Scotland. And um, Scotland in many ways is, is most similar to England in terms of language and culture, but the Scottish for centuries have been trying to gain their independence from England because they feel overshadowed by England. And so today they do have some self-governance. Uh, we call this a devolved self-governance. And that means that they still are a part of the UK. Their country still uh, answers to the British Parliament, which is, you know, meets in Westminster in London. And at the same time, they have some autonomy. They can they can make decisions on their own. And one of the most famous decisions that they made uh, after there was a terrorist attack on an airplane that, that destroyed the airplane and killed hundreds of people, that happened in Scotland. And uh, the suspects were actually uh, imprisoned then in Scotland. But later, the Scottish Parliament uh, decided to release them, or the, I, I, it was actually the Supreme Court. They decided to release those terrorists. And, you know, the rest of the UK wasn't very happy about that, but there was self-government, government, and so they were allowed to make that decision on their own. One thing that's important about Scotland, and this is true about Ireland, and, and you could say Wales too, is there are Celtic cultures. There are, there are old backgrounds that go uh that go very far back in history and uh, we would say there's uh, a Gaelic language that the Scottish people speak and it's similar to the Irish Gaelic and this again it's it comes from the Celtic peoples and so that's very important to the identity of Scottish people they have they don't want to be English but they are still connected to England and Wales and the, in the UK in Northern Ireland but uh, there were many wars for independence, but recently Scotland hasn't declared independence. They've maintained the relationship, even though they could have voted for independence from the UK and the UK would have allowed them to be independent. They voted by, by a very slim uh, majority to stay in the UK. This is true for Wales as well. Wales has another name. It's it's in its own Welsh language. It's called Comri. Okay, and that's spelled C-Y-M-R-U. So it's kind of reverse of what you would think, but Comri is how you say the country's name in Welsh. And uh, the capital is Cardiff, and another major C is Swansea. Another major city is Swansea. So Cardiff and Swansea are the two most uh, notable cities. Uh, a very amazing uh, natural landform is Mount Snowdon. And that is uh, the highest peak in the region. And Wales is known for its coal mining. So it's a land of miners. And that's been the, the cultural identity for hundreds of years. And that has fueled the Industrial Revolution. But unfortunately, Welsh people have often been seen as second-class citizens because of their different culture. They, they often speak uh, Welsh. And, you know, that, that's been a, a problem. They've, they've fought for their own identity. And so uh, the, the Welsh people are still striving to have their own identity, but they are the closest to England uh, in terms of government, they they do have a devolved self-government and a, a parliament, even though it's a weaker parliament than Scotland has, and, and there hasn't been any, any recent movement to break away from England. Uh, Wales wants to be a part of the UK. Uh, the Prince of Wales is the 
kind of a figurehead of Wales, and that is the prince. That is Prince Charles today. The heir to the throne is given that title of Prince of Wales. So again, you know, that shows how close a relationship England and Wales have, maybe even closer than England and Scotland. Now let's talk a little bit about Northern Ireland and Ireland. This is where it gets complicated, the other island of the British Isles. Well, first of all, it used to just be Ireland, but because of religious division between Catholics and Protestants, uh, there, have, there has been fighting. And also England has uh, controlled Ireland, all of Ireland, and Northern Ireland is the part that is still controlled by uh, England and, and the UK, and I say England because that's the capital, London, right? But uh, the rest of Ireland has gained its independence. And so Ireland today is a divided land. They're divided because of religion, uh, Protestants versus Catholics, but they're also divided just because of history and the fact that the UK still controls that northern part and then the southern part is independent. And that will be very tricky once Britain leaves the EU, which is happening very soon. So Northern Ireland is generally the region known as Ulster. So Ulster is the region and it's a Protestant region. Uh, there are Catholics, of course, in, in that area as well, but it's, it's majority Protestant. Now, Protestants and Catholics identify themselves by colors, and that goes back to history as well. Uh, if you wear orange or if you associate with orange, you are Protestant. If you associate with green, you are Roman Catholic. And uh, again, we think of St. Patrick's Day and the green that goes with that. Orange comes from William of Orange, which was a Protestant king that took over England after a very difficult civil war that happened in England. Uh, and so Ulster is basically the, the province of Ireland that is Northern Ireland and the main city there is Belfast. Belfast is known for its shipping. It's a shipbuilding area, uh, and so that's its main industry. Uh, but unfortunately, Northern Ireland is known for Catholics fighting Protestants and uh, some very, very sad tragedies in the past that have resulted in, in uh, people being killed and, and terrorist attacks and things like that. Now, Ireland, or E-I-R-E, -E, Ire, refers to the southern part, most of the island of Ireland. And uh, the capital city of Ireland is Dublin. And uh, one of the most important things to know about Ireland as a whole was what happened in the 1840s. Remember that, uh, you know, when Columbus discovered America, he brought back potatoes from the New World. And potatoes then eventually were spread to the other countries of Europe and became a very important part of their diet because they were strong and they could withstand cold weather and things like that. And so potatoes are grown even in like Iceland. But uh, potatoes were the staple. They were the main food for the Irish. They had other crops. But what happened is there was a blight, a, a uh, bacterial fungus that affected the potatoes and it spread everywhere. It killed the potatoes. This would have been okay if England had not created a situation where uh, the Irish landowners who were basically loyal to the English, they wanted to make money on their other crops. And so even though the Irish people were starving, the English landowners exported the other crops like wheat and basically left the Irish people to starve. This is seen as maybe even an attempt by the English to reduce the Irish population and eventually uh, commit genocide to get rid of the Irish people. What ended up happening is many, many hundreds and thousands of Irish people emigrated to the United States. And the 1840s is when uh, we start seeing large numbers of people coming to the United States for a new life because they were being starved to death, essentially, in Ireland. And so that's the great potato famine, the, the famine of the 1840s. Catholicism has 
been what has set apart Ireland, and it's also been a reason for Ireland and Irish people to be persecuted and to be considered second-class citizens. So for the Welsh, it was the difference of their culture and language and even the type of work they did. For the Irish, it was their religion. And so this is something that we need to know about even England, which seems so close to us. And it reminds us that even in our own country, we have these same divisions and persecutions happening. And uh, there was a revolution in the early part of the 20th century, you know, from 1910 to 1920. Uh, 1915 roughly to 1920 and as a result uh, there was fighting throughout Ireland and eventually Ireland gained its independence uh, and Northern Ireland uh, was supposed to gain more home rule self-rule but because of that tension between the southern part of Ireland and Northern Ireland and religious tension the 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 British basically had a military police force that uh, tried to keep order and they didn't allow much freedom on the part of those Northern Irish um, Catholics, for example, or, or people who were opposing the government. So those are the British Isles, uh, including the island of Ireland. And uh, we've discussed Europe as a whole, and hopefully Mr. Help has come in handy and you can kind of go back and think, which of those parts of Mr. Help apply to what we've discussed. Thanks for listening to this long video.